this morning. The first thing that I want to ask those of you who have just joined, uh, if your name displays as some strange character, will you please, if you can, just change it so that it displays as your own name? Um, yeah, and then the OD talk, uh, you know, we started the OD talk just when we went into lockdown. Actually, we started an OD check-in organization development community just for practitioners and uh, you know World's Fair Academy has the monthly or had the monthly uh, OD cafes and could no longer do that and we decided we'll do an OD talk instead and that morphed into something that we do weekly. So I just want to quickly say to you uh, the next two OD cafes, uh, OD talks, uh, next week, I will be chatting to Vicenta Pather about uh, organizational trauma. And the week after that, we have Dominic Heil, who wrote a very fascinating book about uh, management ethics, uh, using the work of Martin Heidegger. Uh, and, and I think that will also be a very interesting conversation. And then, and then a lot of people after that as well. We'll continue this for, I don't know, as long as we continue it. So Worldsphere Academy, uh, for those of you who are connecting with Worldsphere Academy for the first time, we are an organization development firm, an organization development academy specifically, and we really exist in the world to enable organization development practice uh, in whichever way we can do that. Uh, the core of our work is the Organization Development Academy. We've got a higher certificate in organization development and change. And then we also have organization development interventions for teams, leadership, uh, new managers, and so on, and, uh, and related services. Um, so, so, so check us out on our, our website if there's any organization development support that you need. So then, Louise, our guest this morning, there's a story that I need to tell about Louise. Uh, it's part of Worldsphere Academy's founding mythology. I don't know if you remember this story, Louise. You probably know it better than I do because I have just overheard this story. Uh, and that is that many years ago, you and Craig Yetman, who is the founder of Worldsphere Academy, were sitting, I think, in Stellenbosch under an oak tree, and you were talking about the state of organization development in South Africa. And we know that organization development, you know, every university offers organization development, and it's something else. And every organization that you go to, organization development is sort of, the same and sort of different as well. And you talk about the need for a coherent approach to organization development and the need for organization development education. And what you did according to this mythology, Louise, is you took an acorn and you threw it at Craig, threw Craig with an acorn, and you challenged him to start an academy. And uh, Craig then went out and he did it. He created the, this high certificate in organization development and change. The next step for us as an academy, of course, will, to, will be to, to develop that further and create a master's degree in organization development and so on. Um, and, and we have, Liesl, how many students have been through this program already? Uh, it's quite a few. Yeah, I've more than a hundred. More than a hundred. So, so in a way, we can say that you were the father of the Worldsphere Academy and Craig the mother, which is a bit of a story. <laughs> I wonder what Craig would say about that. Uh, I'm quite comfortable with the idea. Uh, um, you, 
we know that Luis is, is, is one of the most experienced, if not the most experienced organization development practitioner in this country. You left the country at some point and came back because you reckon that there's work to be done here and this is the place to be doing the work. Uh, and, uh, and, and I also know in your, in your life, you've worked a lot with Peter Block, who is one of the heroes of organization development. Uh, certainly one of my heroes, and I think one must have heroes and not too many of them. Uh, and, and I think what has transpired over the past few years is that you have also become one of the heroes of organization development through the Partners for Possibility program, which is, which is, uh, which is probably one of the most significant social interventions. Uh, in our country, specifically because it aims at education. And we know how important education is for, for everything, but especially for democracy and for the survival of our democracy and the, the health and the strength of our democracy. So I want to welcome you to this organization development talk, this OD talk. And uh, I want to hand over to Liesl. And for those of you who don't know, Liesl is our MD. Liesl has been our MD for quite a while now. And uh, she has uh, led World Sphere Academy through, through quite some stormy waters. And here we are still with our academy. Uh, and we are very, very happy to have Louise with us today. Liesl, over to you and Louise. Thank you, Christy. You, um, you made me feel old now. <laughs> Being the MD for that long hasn't been that long. Anyway, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think we've, we've been through such a strange time in the past um, few months where a lot of us, as, as Christy said, we had these morning check-ins with, with our community and we've had some really, really amazing conversations and some of them was about finding our purpose again, sort of um, in this new world, everything is different. We're not entirely sure what we as OD practitioners are supposed to do. What are our roles? Um, and, and that has led us further into the, the conversation of, but what is OD actually? Um, and, and what an interesting topic and how many different definitions and understandings of OD is out there. But um, as most of you will know, if, you, if you're not an OD practitioner or really good OD work and its full impact hasn't touched your life, it's, it's a difficult profession to understand. Um, but we at Wolfsview, we're so passionate about it. We even in our, in our value statement and, and, um, and vision say that we, we exist to evangelize OD. So that's why we're also so excited and passionate about um, the, the talk that we're doing today, where we think and believe that what the work that um, Louise has done with Partners for Possibility has really, really democratized OD. You have taken OD into the world and into organizations and into people's lives in a different way. Instead of trying to preach it and sell it, you made it real and you made it something that, that was making a big difference in people's lives. So on that note, Louise, would we, are we going to start with a bit of a breakaway to let people get to know themselves? Yeah, I think it would be lovely to just create a sense of, you know, we want, we're talking about being in community, so let's not just talk about it, let's do it. Um, so Liesl is going to uh, send everybody off, Liesl, I don't know whether it's you or Roy, but then everybody into breakout rooms of about three or four people in a breakout room. And, um, and we have a question for you prior to us starting this conversation. And the question is, uh, why did you show up for this call? Why did you decide to join this call? And so in your breakout room, start with just introducing yourself to each other so that you can each get a sense as to who the other people are and then ask them um, and just share why did you decide to join? And when we come back into the main room, we're gonna ask you to just put into the chat why you've decided to join. And that will give me something to kind of speak into um, so that we just make sure that it's not, the one thing we don't want is for me to speak at you if I'm an organizational development consultant, that's not 
that's not in line with our with our um, ethos. So, um, so, so for those of you not familiar with breakout rooms, there will be a little line that will come up on your screen that says you are invited to join breakout room number whatever. And it's always, it's like a lucky packet around who's you, who you're going to end up with. The system will decide on your behalf who you will end up with. So are you opening the, 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 the um, rooms for us? I'm ready to push go. Here we go. Thanks, Liesl. So we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes time. In 10 minutes time, you will just be brought back into the main room. Okay. So everybody should now explain. Yeah. Oh, faces are disappearing. There's still a few people that I can see on the screen. Um, you should be getting a little line on your screen saying you're invited to join a breakout room if you accept that. Hi, Carol. We've just sent everybody into breakaway rooms. Um, that's okay. I'm sure there's a few people that's still joining. Um, I'm not sure. People that's still on the screen here. Um, you should be able to accept a breakout room on your screen. Carol, I'm going to assign you to a breakout room. I'm not sure how to do this, but there's a button that says assign. Okay, you're going into breakout room one. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I've got the notice. Cool. Did you accept? No. Amy? I just want to check on the people that's still on my screen. Um, Amy, can you hear me? Lawrence? I can hear you loud and clear. Sorry for the video. That's okay. Okay, so let's ask that. I'm, I'm guessing this is... Um, uh, let me go. Tommy Campbell, I'm assigning you to breakout room number two. Please accept the thingy on your screen. Go assigning you to breakout room three. Please accept the invitation on your screen. Okay, then I guess the, the people who's left over is us. We are a breakout room. <laughs> okay, Diana. Hi, Diana. Sorry. I couldn't find the link. Morning. I couldn't find um, the link. I found it. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. We've just sent everybody into breakout rooms. Um, so you can hang around here with us and um, and chat here. Hi, Dave. Hi, my apologies for being late. <laughs> it's okay. You're missing out on the breakout rooms now because I've already oh, assigned everybody about a few minutes ago. There's about four minutes left of the breakout rooms. So the question we we just discussing in this room is, why did you decide to join today? I've been out of touch for far too long, and this looked like a great opportunity to get back in touch. <laughs> <laughs> and these sessions are always great. That's my normal answer. <laughs> okay. And anything about the topic? Um... To be honest, I've forgotten what it was. Remind me, please. <laughs> <laughs> you just trust us that we always put on great talks, eh? <laughs> but of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about democratizing organization development 
through the work that Louise has done with Partners for Possibility today. Right, right, yeah. Um, we need to get it spread as much as possible. There is so much need for this kind of stuff. And I don't know whether democratization is going to be a label that works. Um, it, it might be a little bit, uh, what's the right way to describe it? Um, it, it, it might be too fancy a label for it, but getting the idea out there and getting large organizations to understand what we're talking about, and then for crying in a bucket, do it. <laughs> <laughs> it it's so uh, it, it's so easy to kind of buy in intellectually and then just carry on as you are. Um, and an awful lot of organizations seem to be that way. Mm. I've been in touch with Cecil, for example, off and on now for, good grief, I don't know, 25 years. And Cecil, the, the, the more senior people, always make all the right noises. And you talk to the people down at the uh, kind of junior to middle professional levels and it's basically the same country it was a company it was under apartheid <laughs> sure. yeah okay i just want to get somebody else to um give an opinion lawrence <coughs> why did you uh, yes to... um yes also um dave i don't know if we know each other but also been 23 years plus with us all associated in some way or another but I'm also in a in private practice and I'm also um, lecturing on OD and it was just time for me being part of the uh, PFP also just to <clears throat> check on I, I, I lecture the, the MBAs and I lecture the honors and master students but I need to find out what's happening what's and, and it sounds like a, a nice topic for us to to just get a different view I'm always curious I'm always learning and the last thing I'll stop doing is learning so um, and I might just throw in something completely awkward and against the grain of everybody, but that's just, just to stimulate some thinking. Thanks, that's why I'm here. Mm. Well said. Great. I'm going to start calling people back. Um, so we're going to, I think we're going to have about 60 seconds. Diana, I'd love to um, get your opinion as well. Why are you here? <laughs> I've done Partners for Possibility last year in Peter Maritzburg. And um, yeah, it was a really interesting exercise because I think there are two things about it. I've been in community development work since for the last 25, 30 years. But Partners for Possibility oh, brings in a hi, brings in a different um, dimension to the whole thing. And the most important thing was the community involvement for me. So I, I loved it, yeah. So I'm here to learn lots more. Right. Okay, more people are going to start coming back to our our room now. For those who, who just joined, um, we've been we've done the introductions and had a little chat, and we've just done a breakaway room for people to chat about why they joined, what does this topic mean for them. Put my video on so they can't see me. Thanks. Hi, Eugene. <laughs> there we go. I just want to say, if you are okay. able to keep your videos on, it makes the world of difference to talk to a group of oh. rather than names on a screen. So if you are okay. able to keep your video on, please do. It's okay. <laughs> but not, not so, the sources. So now, <laughs> so you want to see the faces? <laughs> yeah, it's much nicer. Yeah. I, I don't know whether anybody on this group has had to do um, Microsoft team calls and then because of the way that teams work you can only see eight people at a time and then nobody actually wants to be seen so so you just talk to this row of names and black boxes it is absolutely <laughs> awful I've decided oh, yeah. I'm going to um, um, Liesl is going to teach us how to use WebEx because I cannot, I am not going to be spending my time looking at black boxes. Um, okay, so now what we want is just for everybody to, um, in the chat function, so there's a, there's a thing that looks like a speech bubble at the bottom of your screen. In the chat function, just write down where, why did you decide to join? 
And then anybody else who, who wants to have their voices heard, and we do want to hear about five people. So all of you are invited to write in the chat function, why did you join? And then Liesl's going to keep an eye on that. Um, but, the, but if there's about five people who just want to say, so the way to indicate that you want to speak is just to unmute yourself and then it will come to the top of our list and then you'll know that you want to say something. Who wants to share? Why did you decide to join today? And we're waiting for some brave soul to say. Um, looks like Thank Diana you. wanted to say something. Is it Roy? Who was that? Uh, yeah, it was me, Luis. It looked like yes, Diana put her thumbs up um, to chat, but she's mute. There we go. Di Diana, so if you want to speak, you just need to unmute yourself. But Sorry, a Skype today. call. I got a Skype call coming in at the same time I was on Zoom, so I was getting a bit confused. <laughs> Sorry so about Diana, that. Do you want to tell us why you decided to join? Okay. Oh yes, um, because I've done a few of your talks and seminars and they're absolutely brilliant and I learn hundreds all of the time. <laughs> so I'm being very greedy and just drawing information from you constantly. But I was also just saying earlier that PFP have made such a huge difference in the way I think about community development and I've done it for the last 30 years. And sometimes I wish I'd had this 30 years ago. <laughs> it would have made a great yeah. impact. So yeah, so great. So I'm here to <laughs> learn more. Just, to, just so that I can check, you you, ha, you are or have been a PFP in the um, PFP in Marisburg 1. In Marisburg 1. Thank you yeah. very much, Diana. Thanks for joining us. Okay, Let's hear, I, think he, I see Dave Evans has unmuted himself and then Lorna W. But let's go start with Dave Evans. Dave, why did you very join? Similar, very similar to Diana's comments. Uh, these sessions are always great, whatever the subject is. And I was about to start typing, but I'll just talk instead. I was saying in the breakaway, companies are so good about intellectually espousing this kind of stuff and then in terms of behavior actually changing absolutely nothing. So how do we get them to do it? Exactly. That's part of what I was struggling a few years ago. That was exactly my point. Lorna. Lorna was unmuted just a few minutes ago and then she muted herself again. Lorna, did you want to tell us why you joined? Um, I wasn't going to, but I, I had my unmute on by mistake, but I can just say a few words. I am, um, I'm a social worker and um, I'm very interested in social entrepreneurship, organizational development and hoping to transition the two at some point and maybe start an organization at some point as well. So I'm really here to learn and interested in that. Lorna, I often say to people, if, if my daughters came to me and said, I'm going to start a social enterprise, I will take 10 years to stop them from doing it because you have to be really clear that you want that. you. And having done it, it's been one of the most wonderful things in my life. But I just want, I just want you to know this is, it's, it's not for the faint hearted. <laughs> it's why I haven't um, done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but don't let me put you off because it's amazing if you do do it. I, I do. Th I think there's something about figuring out ways to work with other people rather than having to go through the pain of setting up your own organization. That would be my only advice is, is find other like-minded people who have already gone through the pain of setting up the NPO because to do it yourself is just painful. Um, let's hear from one or two more people who want to just tell us and then Liesl, I'm, I'm sure you're keeping an eye on the chat. You, so you're going to give us a sense as to why people have joined. Maybe I'll, we'll hand over to you. Tell us why did you, what, what are you seeing in the chat function? I'm seeing a lot of admiration for you, Louise, um, and for PFP and the wonderful work you've done through that. Uh, some uh, interest in education, wanting to help schools, um, a few people wanting to learn about business and how to do business in the new normal. Um, a few interested in OD, um, need to get more info on OD. Um, uh, I'm looking at leaving this chat uh, richer, inspired and more knowledgeable. Loads of respect for Louise. Uh, lots of people involved with PFP over the years as well. Oh, so we've got lots of PFPs on the call. Um, Marianne, Ace just had her, she was unmuted and now she's muted herself. Marianne, did you want to say something? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, I'm, I joined because it's one of the 
very few times that I can actually join because of the lockdown. Usually I have to travel very far and I have to take kind of almost like a whole day out of my schedule to join. And so today, because it is on um, Zoom, it's, I'm being able to join. And I also said it's because of you, you always create some magic. So if I know that you're the speaker, I will pitch up if I can, because I don't want to miss out on the magic. That's so beautiful, Marianne. Marianne did something the other day, which I want to just share with you as a gift. She was um, talking to, to a colleague of ours and um, the, our colleague, Dina, uh, and she was saying nice things, which, you know, it's always nice to hear, but you rarely hear. But she was saying nice things about me personally. So I'll talk, I'll be very vulnerable and I'll talk about me myself. So, um, and it was a time that I was going through hell. It, was, it really felt like a very, very tough time. And Dina stopped Marianne mid-sentence and she said, can you stop saying what you want to say? I want, you, I want to record you to saying what you said. And then Dina sent the recording to me. I cried like a baby that evening because I so needed to hear those nice things. And you never hear it because you, you know, you kind of, so thank you, Marianne, for saying those things and then be willing to be recorded and then for it to be sent to me because it really, it, it felt like a I could keep going for, a next, for, for the next week or so after that. So thank you so much. So Liesl, tell us how you want to, um, do you want us, to me to just dive into it or do you want to ask me some questions or how do you want to handle this? No, I think just, just dive into it. I think there's, there's people um, on the call that's not as familiar with PFP. Um, so, so maybe you can tell us about that and your journey and then, and then just dive into your, your subject. Thank you. So the way we're going to handle it is um, if anybody wants to respond to anything I say and, and are you welcome to do that on Zoom? I'm not going to keep my eye, sorry, on the chat function. I'm not going to keep my eyes on the chat function because I want to keep my eyes on you. But Lisa has agreed that she will keep her eyes on the chat function. I'm going to keep my eyes on people who want to put their hand up or want to indicate that they want to say something. Because we're, we're a lot biggish group, we're 69 people. It's impossible for me, I'm not just not physically possible for me to see all the names on the screen. So, but if you put your hand up, so there's a, there's a function on the bottom of your screen to, to raise hand under the, the participants. If you raise your hand electronically, then I can see it even if you're not on the screen that I'm looking at at any particular time. And we'd love you to participate rather than just to have me speaking at you the whole time. But I do, Liesl and, um, and Krista, thank you for that introduction. I do want to say something about, because the, the, the journey is important, the, the kind of history. So, so I, I, and I'm going to go back more than 30 years now. I started life as a computer programmer. I programmed a, a, a hospital systems, in, in, interestingly. For a while, didn't start with hospital systems, but I became involved in hospital systems and then um, ended up uh, being the project manager for, for large hospital implementation at a very young age. Um, I was the project manager for the implementation of the um, hospital system into Universitas Hospital in Bloemfontein for my sins. And then went to um, uh, London, long story, but I went to London and I was involved in implementing hospital systems for the National Heart and Chest group of hospitals in, in, in the UK and got very interested in um, the kind of intersection between technology and people and how when you throw new technology at people, um, it rocks their worlds and, and has a massive impact on their sense of competency and identity and how they see themselves in the world. And I, I was really grappling with this. So it, I ended up doing an MBA in, order, in, a kind of, in an attempt to understand that space. I wanted to understand, you know, people and technology and change and, you know, became involved in change management and, and all sorts of things. But got really, I was really frustrated because it didn't help me, it didn't help me practice differently. And that led me to organizational development because I realized that it's about, we need to understand the, the science and the art of organizing and, and we need to learn how to take people on this journey of change. It's not just, you know, shouting at them and telling that they have to adopt and have to change and, you know, have to implement, and get with the program and be on the bus and all that. None of that stuff actually helped. 
So, so I then had the, the privilege and the opportunity to do a doctorate in large scale complex so social change and worked for arguably at the time it was one of the, the you know, world renowned organizational development consultancies, Ashridge Consulting in the UK. And then I came back and we came back initially, Christo, not just because we think there was work to do, but because my husband, who's a very keen, keen diver and spear fisherman and whatever, couldn't cope with the, the UK weather. And then my very young daughter also struggled. So anyway, we came back for many reasons. And, um, and I met Craig and my frustration was that most of, now this was almost 20 years ago now, 20 years ago, my experience in, of South African business was um, very little, or let's say it's 15 years ago, 15 years ago, a very little appreciation for the science and art of organizational development. And the reason why I challenged Craig to start Worldview Academy was because as someone who was trying to sell organizational development services into the space, I, I felt that my buyers were not very uh, well, they, they didn't really understand the space. So, so that was my frustration. And it's kind of weird because it's now, you know, that was 15 years ago. And then I got involved in PFP and I'm going to tell the story about that, but it's, I am now, I've just, I'm, I'm in week eight of a 12 week handover process to hand over my role as PFP program director to a new person. And part of the, my thinking is I want to go back into the world of OD. And so I'm interested to know what has happened to the space during this time. And, you know, are we going to find a different, Am I going to find a different receptiveness to OD now if I go back? But it sounds like it. It sounds like there's been massive change. And so Worldview has done their, their job. So uh, the topic today is about democratizing OD. And, um, and I think it's, it's actually just the story about, it, you know, the story started, I wanted to practice my craft. I was frustrated with what was happening in, in commercial organizations, for-profit organizations. Um, I remember driving home, this is again an interesting story, I don't know whether I want to necessarily have this recorded, but anyway, the story is I came home one day um, having uh, facilitated a workshop for BAT, cigarette company. And, um, and it was a fabulous workshop. I mean, I really, I, I, did, I think I did a fabulous job as facilitator and designer of the session. But as I was driving home, I thought to myself, is this what has become of me? I am now helping BAT figure out how to sell more cigarettes. Is this what I'm gonna do with my craft? And I just, I couldn't do it. I felt like, I didn't want to do that. Um, so, um, started to kind of grapple with, well, how do I, where can I, can I practice my craft and realize that education is, is a critical area. And I, and it was like, I would go every day to go and work, you know, with clients at large organizations and I, and I experienced them being, you know, a bit kind of fed up and irritated and not very happy and disengaged and, and, and I, you know, here I was putting my heart and soul into something and then I'd, I'd be, I'd experience this just level, high levels of disengagement. And then I would work with people in the social sector. I would go and do, you know, a tenth of what I would do in one of the large corporates in, in education at a school and people will lap it up and they would love it. And it would just, it was just as a practitioner, amazing to have such engaged and excited clients. I mean, they didn't pay me, but they were interested in what I had to do, what I had to say and what I had to do. So that was, in, that was in, enticing for me. Um, I see Bianca, Bianca saying, I also feel conflicted with work because I was working in work I was doing in the alcohol industry. It's a challenge. It's a real challenge for us when, when we kind of have to work in spaces that just doesn't feel like it, it resonates with your value system. So anyway, long story short, I decided I was going to go and do OD at a school. And um, it was as a result of a visit from Peter Block. So Peter Block came to South Africa 
and he did these amazing community building workshops with us. I don't know whether there's anybody on the call who was at one of those workshops, um, but it was all based on the six conversations of community and, and Peter challenged us. He said, what if we took some of these ideas into our education space and, and, and we had this, we came up with this dream of school at the center of community. And the vision, all OD people want to have a vision. What is it that we're working towards? And so the vision was for communities to be mobilized around schools. And initially my thinking was, so all we need to do is we need to train the principals because they are the leaders and OD people like to work with leaders. They are the leaders and we need to train the principals to, to mobilize the community around the school and to strengthen, um, you know, strengthen the leadership capacity at the school. And then as I started to work with principals, I realized that actually their day job is fuller than any other, day, any other leaders. It's just not feasible to ask school principals to now mobilize their community because we haven't trained them to do it. They don't know where to start, you know, all that stuff. So I had to go, to go back to the drawing board and say, well, how would we do that? How would we mobilize communities around schools. Um, actually, let me just step one back, one, one further step back. Um, as I started to get interested in this, I, I, I realized that in South Africa, we have two systems of education. And the reason I'm telling you the story, because it's another uh, organizational development methodology that I just quickly want to introduce, but we have two um, systems of education. We have 20,000 schools that are really struggling and then we have 5,000 schools that are doing very well. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've never had money to put my children in a private school. So they've been to good government schools, all to both my children. And there's a methodology, there's an OD methodology for that. It's called positive deviance. And it says if you have in a system, a small group of people, organizations, instances where it goes well and you have a large group where it doesn't go well instead of doing what we always do and to write reports about how bad things are and how things are not going well why don't you study where it, the instances where it does go well so it's a bit like if you want to have a great marriage it's a really good idea to study examples of good marriages rather than studying divorce but what we've done in South Africa for years and years and years, we've been studying failure. So we have written more reports about what's going wrong in the 20,000 schools than we have written anything about what's going well in the 5,000 schools. So I thought, well, I don't know anything about education, but I do know about OD and I do know about positive deviance, so let's do that. So, so I started to look at what are the, what are the factors that, that make the 5,000 schools work so well? Now, the reality is that most of those 5,000 schools were built on foundations of white privilege. So these are historical, but if we just look at where they are right now, we've, I found that there were two massive differences between the schools that work well and the schools that struggle. And one has to do with the school principal and the second had to do with the community. So in the schools that work well, we have school principals who've been equipped for their task. In the schools that don't have such fabulous outcomes, we have teachers who were promoted into the role of principals. So if anybody knows anything about um, uh, uh, being a school principal, it is a very different skill set. When you're a school principal, you have to manage a very complex organization, manage and lead, a very complex organization in a volatile environment with very difficult stakeholders, with almost no resources. It's like, it is, it is an impossible task. And again, I can, I have, a, you know, a day's worth of stories around how much more difficult it is to run a school in South Africa than it is to be the leader of any of the difficult challenges. One of our business partners said a while ago, he said, um, you know, in South Africa, he was talking to a group of international students. He says, in South Africa, we have companies that are really struggling with difficult stuff. And at the time it was Lonman. He says, I, you know, let me tell you about Lonman. Lonman is a mining company and they've gone through a really difficult time and Marikana and all that. He says, but if anybody ever offered me a job today, 
and they gave me the same amount of money to be the CEO of Lonman or a school principal in an under-resourced school, I, I will choose to be the CEO of Lonman if it's the same amount of money. And we all went, why on earth would you do that? He says, because in Lonman, at least I will have an HR person and I will have a finance person and there will be an IT person and there will be, I have, I'll have a team. When I'm a school principal in an under-resourced school in Dipsluit, it's me. And I have 20 teachers who are busy eight to five. And it will be me and I will have nowhere, you know, who do I ask to help and who do I, who do I call on? And I don't have the skill. Anyway, so my question was, how do we use that knowledge? So we've got this insight from Positive Deviance. We have 20,000 schools where there's a desperate need. Um, how do we use that information to create something? And then Peter Block introduced me to asset-based community development. So for those of you who may not have done, have been introduced to that, I really want to encourage you to study. Um, Cormac Russell has just written a new book uh, about it. There's some amazing work around asset-based community development. But essentially what it says is, is in a community, when, when the community is struggling with whatever it's struggling with, um, the first, the, the place to start is to look at the assets in that community. What are the underutilized assets that can be tapped into? Um, Cormac, so, so the, um, the, the book, the Cormac Russell is the, the latest book that was published, but he's a, he's a student of the original founder, John McKnight. And there's a wonderful book. If you, you know, the book to get into initially is, um, is written by John McKnight and Peter Block, and it is called The Abundant Community. And it is, it, it will get you so excited about what's possible when you read The Abundant Community, Peter Block and John McKnight. John McKnight is the founder of Asset-Based Community Development. Anyway, so, so now we've got this insight that says it's about the principles and the, and the community, and we've got the insight that says, um, the Asset-Based Community Development says, let's look at the underutilized assets. And in my mind, at the time, my, my world was all around organizational development. I felt that there were two big underutilized assets that we could tap into. One was business leaders. So, so if you're a business leader and you've worked in a big bank your whole life and you have been spoiled by training courses and leadership development courses and doing an MBA and senior leadership development and all that stuff, the sad part about it is like Microsoft Office, we only use 3% of what Office is able to, to give us. If you're a business you're leader a business. and been, been equipped with all these knowledge and skill, you probably only use 3% of it when you go back to a big bank. I always use NetBank as an example because NetBank's been one of our big partners. But you know, if you, you go out, you do your MBA, you go back into NetBank, how much of what you've learned in your MBA are you actually able to use in NetBank? Because NetBank has a vision and it has a structure that works and it has, you know, it has everything in place. Your job as a leader is, there's actually not that, there's, there's lots that you can do in your specific area, but a lot of the stuff that you've learned, you can't use. So my question was, could we take people, I'm looking at them in front of me and I'm just, Orestes was on the screen earlier. Someone like Oresti, I mean, he's one of the most amazing leaders I've ever led in my, met in my life, but he runs an ad agency and obviously he does great stuff as being an ad agency manager, but could we tap into that knowledge and skill and take Oresti across the, the, the bridge to, to Alex, which we did, and in doing that, change both Oresti's life as well as the the principal's life and that was my question it was so i decided i'm going to practice i'm going to test it so i started to work with as an organizational development consultant so i saw myself as an underutilized asset i was doing workshops for bat for goodness sake i had knowledge and skills and experience about leading change and running organizations i knew about asset-based community development and i and i was infused by peter block around this idea of school at the center of community and I, I showed up one day, I said to Ridwan, and Ridwan said yes. So we, we invited a group of principals. We said, who's willing to 
work with this mad white woman from the northern suburbs who's willing to try this out and Ridwan said I'm in I'll try this out and Ridwan and I started to work together in April 2010 by December that year I was convinced that I could not keep this idea for myself that we needed to find a way to make that make it possible for other people like Mateus and Diana and I'm just looking at all these people on the on, on the screen if I can quickly spot a few more Berna is one of our Hanel um, you know could, could we create an opportunity for people like all of those people to go into schools and do be, be in the school, be a partner to the principal in the way that I was, um, in the same way, or in the same way that I was with Ridwa. Now, the, the interesting part here, the, 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 the story that we don't often tell, is that in about, so Ridwa and I started to get, work together in April. By about July, I was so excited about this idea. I said to eight people in my network, why don't you all go and be partners to principals? And then we'll all do this. We'll all work with a principal to mo mobilize the community around the school. And when we checked in with those people in December, what we found, and this is important from us for, from an OD perspective, what we found is that in none of those other eight, eight partnerships, there was real change happening. The only partnership where there was lots of things happening was Ritwan and my partnership. So it's kind of sent me back to the drawing board and said, well, could that be because I'm an organizational development consultant? So I, that's what I do. I know how to work with clients and to take clients on a journey and how to, you know, that's my craft. Um, and the answer was possibly. So we said, if, if I want to, if I, so I had a, I had a vision that we could scale the program. I never thought we would end up in, I mean, we're in one, We've, we've launched 1,298 of these partnerships so far. I, I never had that kind of scale in mind. I thought we'll, we'll you know, maybe, maybe 100 of these partnerships. But it was still important for me to say, how do, we, how do we set those people up for success? How do we set Mateus up for success? How do we set, you know, all of these other partners? In, and the partners for possibility, if you can put your, your videos on, then it means that your name will show up on my screen and that'd be so nice to you know, see your faces. Anyway, um, so that was my question is how do we do that? And we, and, and again, I was, I felt incredibly privileged. Now, when I look back at it, I, I feel that I was incredibly privileged because I had so many tools to my disposal. But the one tool I had, which I think personally is the, is the, it's the magic bullet. If anybody's ever wanted a magic bullet for organizational development and leadership development and capacity building, because we have a massive capacity building issue in this country, but we, we, we don't know how to support people to get better in their, with their job. Because I'm a bit irritated with, with us as, as an OD community who do all this soft and fluffy stuff, but it actually doesn't help people to get better at their job, which was what Wolfie Academy was going to be different. It was going to be to really help people get better at their jobs, not just, you know, have mindfulness exercises. Sorry for all the people who just do mindfulness exercises. I don't think that's OD actually. I think that's personal development and it's something else, but it's not organizational development. I was interested in how do we get organizations to work better and how do we get leaders to lead better? So, um, so I had a few things, a few tools in my toolkit. And the one which I'm excited about and I'm gonna share a screen about just because it's gonna help us to talk about this a bit. And then I do want to, not be the only one speaking, so I'm going to ask someone else to say something. Um, is this is this idea of 70-20-10. So Liesl, if you could keep an eye on the chat and if anybody wants to kind of get us into a conversation. But anyway, 70-20-10 says the following. It says that leaders learn the most. 70% of their learning happens from doing the work, their work, whatever their work is. 20% happens through developmental relationships and social learning. So I earlier spoke to one of the coaches. So, so coaching, being part of a learning community, peer learning, reflection, 
there's 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 definitely value in that twenty huge value in the twenty percent. It's the it's for partners possibility. It's what's made. It's what what makes or breaks a an experience. And then there's ten percent, which is about training, formal training in a classroom. So my thinking was, could we use this method, this idea, this idea of 70% happens on the job, 20% happens through developmental relationship, and 10% happens through classrooms. Could we use that um, to craft an experience that will enable the Orestes and Matasis of this world to go and be organizational development practitioners in schools, in very unfamiliar environments, that will give them, that will set them up for success, will give them and their partners the best chance of being successful. So let me stop here. And, and so, so we, I haven't told you anything about yet about how we then put this whole process together, but, I, but, but, but the, I've given you the background and how we've used organizational development thinking to finally put Partners for Possibility together, which is, just for those of you who don't know what it is, it is a leadership development and principal support program. So we support school principals to, to strengthen capacity in their schools. And we do that by, by, by putting them or by giving them the opportunity to participate in a year long leadership development program that is a 70 20 10 leadership development program. And the outcome is in a school. Uh, increased leadership capacity in the school because the principal and the team has started to shape and do the readiness for change work at the school. But it is simultaneously a program to build our nation because we bring people ac together across traditional boundaries. And it is a, it is a leadership development program for, um, for business leaders because they leave their comfortable offices and they go and spend time in communities that's very different from theirs and and their lives get changed through that exposure and through the learning that comes from that so um liesel where, who wants to say something or who do we need to ask or any comments on what i've said so far or maybe we should send people back in back room so that they can talk a bit <laughs> do you want to do that do we don't have any comments in the chat uh ramesh is commenting on peace education at timestoday.tv and that's it that can be implemented at all levels thanks Ramesh um yeah so so may, may, I think what I'll do now is I, I just want to create an opportunity for a few people who've been part of Partners for Possibility who have been thrown into you know a program that took them by the hopefully took them by the hand and, and created an opportunity for them to have massive impact uh, I would say beyond the beyond what many of them thought possible, because of the fact that we so carefully designed this program. So I'm I'm going to put some PFPs on the spot. Any partners for possibility want to say something about their own experience of being part of this program? Oresti. And Oresti, there you go. I've been setting Oresti up. Oresti and I haven't spoken for a long time. So Oresti, it's really beautiful to see your face. So now you're on the spot. I've missed you, Louise, but yeah, that's why I thought, let me come on to this uh, session again. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I think for me, the most important thing about connecting within this, um, within the PFP space, is that it's so easy as a business leader to really connect with the, with the principal. So how I got involved, actually, um, was that um, as you're having dinners, Everybody's complaining about the, the, the situation in the country. And I'm generally a positive person. And I was, felt I was getting sucked into this. I tried to get involved with schools on my own um, because I thought that was the, the way to really change this country. And actually, I couldn't. It was just I was getting blocked left, right, and center. So in my frustration, like people do, is you um, vent your anger on Twitter. And... <laughs> <laughs> and Louise actually tweeted me back and said, come and listen to what's, what, what we have to offer. And I was a little bit skeptical in the beginning, I have to say, but um, I, I went to one of the sessions. I think this was about 2013, if I'm not mistaken, 2012, somewhere around there. 
And I was hugely impressed. But I wasn't sure yet how, to, how this will all, all happen. Um, and I threw myself in as entrepreneurs normally do, just, okay, let's just try out, see what happens. And I got involved. And it's absolutely incredible how uh, Partners for Possibilities and I, from a, part, from a business perspective, and the principal kind of connected. You, the, the way they connected us and understood our personalities, understood where it's easy. So I live in Santon to try and get us linked up to a, a school in Alex made it simple to get involved. So a lot of people want to get involved, but they don't really know how to. So PFP made it, made it really, really interesting, but also simple to, to get involved and, and really how your mindset um, changes. Uh, just, uh, I, I can carry on for hours and I won't because I mean, Solly and I, the principal now, he ended up getting a doctorate. Um, he's now at UNISA. I'm still very friendly with Solly. I mean, uh, about uh, just before, in fact, it was just after lockdown, maybe we shouldn't say this, but even after lockdown, we ca he came over to the house for dinner um, and he's starting a, 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 a new business um, and we're kind of getting involved, uh, not getting involved um, for, from a shareholding perspective, but I'm helping him try and get his business up and running. So, yeah, so I'm still friendly with Solly. We talk at least once a month um, and we've got a really great bond and a great relationship and it's, but the, the important thing is Partners for Possibility made it easy for people who want to get involved to get involved. And I think that's the, that's the biggest outcome. Thank you, Oresti. And I just, that, uh, that's such a beautiful story. Now, and I went to speak to Nick Benadell right at the early, when I started to think about this. And I said, you know, I've got this idea of bringing, bringing people like Oresti and other business leaders involved. He said, oh my goodness, don't, don't. I said, why? He said, you know, because these business leaders just want to go and fix stuff. And they go into the school and they come with their preconceived ideas and they just want to give advice. And so, that, so, and I know that's one of the things that, that OD practitioners need to, need to learn is to not do that. So it's one, it's one of the things that Liesl and, and Chris do and them teach at the, um, at the academy is whatever you do as an OD consultant, don't just jump in thinking that you know what the solution is. Uh, uh, Peter Block one-liner that many of you have heard says, whatever the client says is the problem is not the problem. So don't get sucked into that. And so in, invest in the relationship and invest in the understanding of the environment. And so that's one of the ways that we've, we've kind of um, made sure that someone like Oresti doesn't go in and say to Solly, I have some solutions for you because, you know, I've been a business leader my whole life and I'm an entrepreneur that we, we, we forced Solly and, and, and Oresti to be on a learning journey together. And we put them through training like Time to Think, which, which you know, why on earth would you do that? And, and through Time to Think, they learned how to be thinking partners to each other and how to change that, that dynamic that typically says be business is on top and principal, you know, education is at the bottom. And we moved them into a adult to adult generative relationship. I love that. Thank you, Bianca. Partners, she says, Partners Possibility is a model for collaboration, healing, and transformation in South Africa. Thanks, Bianca. Wow, that's beautiful. We should, we should put those words on a, on a slide somewhere. But anyway, so, so, so they went through, through Time to Think. And then we taught them about Theory U. And we said, the, I don't think, actually think we, we had that language clearly articulated when, when, when Arresti joined it. We said, we're not going to let you go start with doing some stuff. We want you to be in relationship. We want the business leader to really understand the issues. And then we're going to get you to do flawless consulting, which I think is core for all um, OD consultants to do. But it is around teaching the business leader and the principal that if you've got, you know, a, 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 a vision that you envisage, how do you take your stakeholders along? And how do you contract for success with your stakeholders? But anyway, I want to hear from one or two other PFPs who, who want to say something about their experience of being organizational development practitioners, even they didn't quite know that that's what they are. Mateus, yes, let's hear from you. You just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, well, morning everybody. This is my first Zoom session, believe it or not. And like yeah. many of you, Say again, and many of, like many of you, I'm probably 
a jack of many trades and not necessarily a master of any at this time. But I want to say this, that partners for possibility and my involvement has been a, an absolutely amazing journey. And when you think you can't learn anymore, that's exactly when you start learning, if you are mindful about this stuff. And one of the, the, the things that um, Louise earlier referred to is one of the intentions of PFP is to get the communities involved. And I still believe that is one of the critical successes and, and points of focus within the Partners for Possibility program. I was fortunate enough because of where I work as a journalist to start with a uh, school pages as we refer to it, which is unique or was unique in the sense that we got the learners at the various schools involved in actually preparing and writing their little articles that we then put together uh, with, their, with their involvement in designing a school page, which we then published in one of our sister uh, papers at the low, at low felt media. I still want to revitalize that because we had to stop because, you know, media is a business like anything else. If you don't have advertising, you can't sell the pages or use the pages. But one of this, one of the, the main things that I, that we all, every, every school, but eventually we did not, we involved not just the eight schools that was working in my circle, we involved some of the, the other circles as well. But the, the, the difference this has made within the communities was just absolutely mind boggling. And that's why I simply just have to find a way to revitalize and, and get this project going again. Obviously now with COVID and, and all the economic implications, I'm not too sure that it will still happen at low felt media though. So I'm exploring uh, <coughs> some, idea, some ideas in terms of how we can take this project forward. But the importance of what I've learned is, is to get buy-in. One of the most important things that the principals have to learn is to delegate because that's something that they don't understand. The rural schools do not understand fundraising and entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And we did a number of projects throughout all the schools, which, which resulted with, with amazing income generating opportunities. The other thing that I also like about the PFP program and OD development which is not necessarily a speciality for me at this moment in time, but there are principles and ideas that I can take from you who has worked in this field for a long time that we can adopt and change and fine tune a little bit and implement is that listening first. Now I am not necessarily someone who speaks a lot. I prefer to listen and think before I speak. So this program has just confirmed that at least in terms of that, I'm on the right track. Because you know, as people who is involved in business, we just want to go, go, go. And school principals are not ready to go, go, go. And neither is the, the, the teaching staff. So it takes a lot of patience to, to develop the, the friendships initially first not just with the principal, but also with, uh, with the teaching staff. And then to get them at the point where they actually say, okay, well, that sounds like an, a good idea. Principal, I will, I will drive that. So one of the most important things I think through the whole pro uh, PFP program is that we empower principals to duplicate themselves successfully. Now, I'm also not a, a, a spoon feeding kind of person and I'm not into detail. I'm a big picture person. So 
but sometimes with this program, you have to dig into the small stuff as well, because people just don't have the emotional intelligence necessarily, and I don't mean that in a negative state, that's just a fact. Because we, we come from different backgrounds, we know different things, and through PFP we find ways of synchronizing these small little things. Because PFP is not necessarily about doing big things, but if you do the small things consistently and mindfully, shit happens, excuse my friends, but that's just how it is. So that's one of the things that, that I think what makes the program so successful. And um, hopefully, if we, if we continue with this, we, we can create masters in, in with some of the, uh, the principles and even the, the, the various schooling bodies. But yeah, it's an amazing program. It's important that we network because I need solutions for some of the challenges that, that, uh, that I want to go forward with. And that's one of the reasons why I joined today. I mean, uh, I can't always phone Louise because she's a busy, a busy girl and she don't have always, don't have time to advise, but there's tremendous power within the community, within this OD community, within the communities within and around our schools. And I think one of the things that I said in the book is, as well is that Partners for Possibility creates space. And there are many things that you can fill those spaces with, but if you, don't, if you do not create the space for development or X, Y, or Z, you're going to know that. So this is one of the main things I think and, and successes of PFP, it creates space. Space to think, space to do, space to share. So, and thank you for you guys for allowing me to be part of this and for Louise as well. Thank you, Matthijs. And so a few things. Can I just ask Matthijs, um, you, you're a journalist and you were taught as a, trained as a journalist. Uh, have you found that this program has given you some some guidance around how to build capacity that's ultimately what what we're trying to do through this is that that you know being part of that circle in Nelspreit, having mel as your learning process facilitator attending the courses so what i'm trying to i'm, I'm hoping that the idea was that the design of the program will enable a journalist in Nelspreit to have massive impact in schools in the Nelspreit community, I think beyond what you thought might be possible, Matthijs. Yeah, yeah that's why I said it, it's important for me because with all of with this whole program, there was a heart connection. And I think it's important with these sort of development programs that you that there is a heart connection. People need to get out of their, their brain spaces sometimes because um, it's one of the principles now that is becoming very important in journalism uh, in general. The, the clever people like Louise and others who works in this environment says, as a journalist, you must write in a way that you connect with your reader. And if you don't connect with your reader on an emotional level, you are wasting your flipping time. And I think what this school pages project is doing and what, what, uh, what PFP is doing in general is we connect with all those involved on an emotional level. And that is what, what makes it easier for people to buy in because if you, if you work from the heart, there's authenticity. And this is something that is so seriously lack in so many different levels uh, in society at the moment. We see it in government, we see it in business, we see it all over. And things are going um, bad because there is no authenticity. And that's one of the other, other brilliant things about Partners for Possibility. You create the relationship. It's based on, on, on mutual respect because you listen before you talk. You don't rush in where angels fear to threat. 
or tread, you just you prepare the ground before you rush in there. And part of that prepare process is to connect with the heart of all those you are involved with. And that's what, what we have done in in uh, in, in Nelspreit with the with the various circles. I mean, one of the things that we did is we we did profile stories on the various principles. We did profile stories on the business leaders that was involved. And just from the principles point of view, this kind of made them become celebrities within the community. So they are being recognized. People understand if, if the principal says, look, I'm in trouble. We need X, Y, or Z. Then the community now have a completely different understanding of who the principal is. So it's a lot easier because they now know the person. They know the heart. They know the wants. They know where the principal and, and the SGBs wants to go. So and that, that creates buy-in. <laughs> We, yeah, we I'm get, sorry, we, we can go we're on to this. A whole webinar. We're going to do a whole <laughs> webinar on the power of the media. Yeah, and we're going absolutely. To Max Dupria and Bruce Whitfield and a whole bunch of these people because I think there's, some, there's a story in there. But I just want to kind of go, in terms of coming back to the democratizing of OD, so Matthijs has just explained a few things that's on the screen. Firstly, he's, he brought his gifts. He's a journalist. And he brought the gifts of his organization into that, into what happens. But I'm, I'm seeing Felix Hacker on the call. And Felix has been part of a, a program in, in Let's See Tele for oh, eight years now. So Felix, I'm gonna, I'm, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to just say something about your experience. But just to quickly come back to Matthias's point. So what happened in the past in South Africa? And, and there, I mean, we, many case studies in, in 2012, 2013, there was a whole big project to use coaches and uh, consultants into schools in, in Limpopo. And what they did is they, um, they, they, they got these people from big consultancies, they paid for their transport and their accommodation and took them to Polakwane. And then when these people got to Polakwane, there was a crisis in the school. And then they couldn't do anything. And then they sat waiting for the crisis to get resolved and got their timesheets signed in the meantime, and then went back to Joburg. And that's the point about the heart connection is when Mate shows up at his school or Felix shows up at his school and the principal said, sorry, I've got a crisis. I can't do what we said we're going to do. Matei says, let me go and talk to someone else. Let me do something. Or I'll come back tomorrow. Or because, he's, because there's a hard connection, he's willing to make, put extra time in. So, so just, I just want to quickly talk you through the process and then I'm going to ask Felix whether he's willing to say something. But, so the idea is that um, business leaders and like Matei and Oresti and, and many of the other people on the call uh, get partnered with the school principal. And they join what we call a community of practice or a leadership circle and then they start on their journey and we have a launch process where we introduce them to the thinking and you know in a, in a typically in a face-to-face -face space now that we're doing this virtually we're doing it through three two hour two and a half hour sessions and we ask them to to just immerse themselves and throw up with interest and curiosity in the school and please do not do anything other than to learn and to be in relationship for two and a half months so that's taking theory you tapping into all of our learning about organizational development is you cannot be useful until you understand and so we're inviting people to, to arrive open heart open mind open will during that period they do a time to think course. So it's a one day time to think course. And that course is specifically designed to teach them how to think together and to break down the, or, or to change the hierarchy. So that this is now two adults, two peers who are working. In the meantime, the, there's a coach. So, um, so, so Oresti has access to a coach when he goes, oh my goodness, why would they do that? And I'm irritated. And why did he not, and why does he not have the emotional intelligence? And why did he not respond when I called, you know, all that stuff? They have a coach that they can talk to. They, they, 
attend community of practice meetings every two and a half weeks that are very carefully designed to make everybody a little bit uncomfortable and to come with real challenges. And it's built on Etienne Winger's idea around community of practice. So they go through the bottom left hand side of the U and then when they, when they get to the bottom of the U, we ask them to start to talk about, and this is slightly different from when Oresti and, and Felix and Matthijs did it, because this is a recent development. We start them to kind of come up with a plan for the partnership and to envisage, you know, five, five years out into the future and, and towards the end of the year. They then attend Flawless Consulting, where we teach them specifically around how do you work together as adults in a collaborative partnership to address these issues. So it's both for the two partners, but also how do you take your stakeholders along as you want to facilitate change in the school? And then we've given them some guidance. Initially, the guidance, we didn't have the guidance because we thought this is a leadership development program and they need to figure out it for themselves. But again, we've brought some guidance. We've given them, we give, we've give people guidance to say, um, the partnership, in order to achieve this magic outcome, which we still have as our North Star, school at the center of community, they need to work at four levels of change. They need to work with the principal to ensure that the principal become confident and energized to lead. That's very similar to what we would do in any large organization. We'll start to work with the leader, leader and we will then encourage the, the business partner and the principal to work at the level of the school management team to ensure that the school management team becomes aligned and cohesive. Then when the school management team is ready to take leadership to work with the teachers, to ensure that the teachers are energized. And so we tap into a lot of the stuff that we typically do in large corporates around engagement and employee engagement. And finally, we want to get the parents and community engaged. And, and because that's a really tough ask and it's not an easy thing to do, we do another piece of input. So we've taught them initially how to do the first two and a half months. Then we give them something, we, we teach them how to do the next phase. So it's all just in time. And then they do the third two-day workshop, which is a beautiful workshop. I can, everybody in this, on the school should at some point in their life attend that two-day community building workshop, which is to say, okay, so how do you engage your community in a, in a kind of, you know, as partners to, your, to, the, to the process? Um, and then, so then that bring, takes us to the end of the one-year process, which is facilitated and we have a celebration and, we ask, it's an accountability opportunity for people to say, here's what we've learned. This is what we want to do going forward. And then magic happens in places like Let's Itele, where Felix and his partner decided, great, we've given, you've given us the tools. You've given us the initial thing. Now we, two leaders, are going to take this further. So Alex, uh, Felix, sorry to put you on the spot, but would you be willing to just say a little bit about what you and your principal have achieved in Let's since 2013, is it? 14, yeah. Good morning, Louise, and to all the participants. It's indeed a privilege to be um, telling you about our, our journey. Um, as Matthias said, this, this was definitely a journey for us all, specifically as we and the business leaders that I'm involved with are all from the agricultural sector up in Limpopo. So typically left brain thinkers, you know, analytical, science, maths, accounting, and realizing very quickly the complexities, as we said earlier on, of a school principal's job. And I would definitely also not take that on in our current environment with the, under, with the schools that have uh, not been resourced properly. Um, I think one of the big things for us here has been crossing over the cultural barrier that's been prevalent in many of the farming communities where it's basically been seen as the um, rich, arrogant farmer who looks after with fruit and whatever he has, some of the poor local community people. Um, and trying to break that stereotyping, let's put it that way, in our grouping which came out very strongly in the first session where we basically had it broke down into groups and, and to understand where people come from, you know, understanding their issues if you want to see it from their perspective. And it's very easy to point finger if you're in a privileged or on the outside position. 
So what that showed us was the incredible plight that our, our rural schools in our area here in Let's Italy and the Great Sinning area are. Um, talk about privilege, it's really scary when you get five or six hundred rand per student per year to do all the cultural and every, all the, all the after hour development of these kids through with 500 rand a year per student. I mean, it's scary. Um, and it's not just those resources, but just getting to know that and then understanding the problems they have, as you rightfully said, Luis, it was um, as a business leader, we have HR, finances, all the support we want and can get and pay for. Whereas in the schools, it's pretty much the principals and incredibly dedicated. You know, I've grown to love my, my partner, um, Makanani. She's really a wonderful teacher. She's been in schooling for so long. So you can see it's a teacher that does it or a principal by heart. She loves the children, she loves the people. And as Matthias correctly said, it's definitely an issue of heart in the beginning, getting to know your, your partner. I think that was probably the thing where as business partners, one decides too quickly how to fix problems instead of asking and getting to know your partner first. And, um, and that's where we come from, basically. Um, if I can say as a story or a success factor to the grouping over here is that we actually centralized our COP meetings. Um, we've got six partners or seven partners that come together and is managed by a Karos Foundation, which is a, a non-profit organization, which is part of a, um, one of the big farming community or farmers over here. And just coordinating um, us as business leaders and the principals on a regular basis, just to spend time together on a, in, a, um, in a meeting to understand each other's issues and where we can help each other and not just our individual um, uh, school principal, because that's where the community comes in. We, it's very easy just to give money and help on that level, but if you can use your networks and your connections um, it makes a big difference. And then finally, just to add, um, one of our very big international or national citrus farmers over here was in a meeting where he said he's actually quite ashamed and embarrassed that he knows most of the white business people or successful white business people in the area, but he's never made the point of getting to know the successful black business people because until we get everybody in the community at all levels, not just the the, the businesses to the poor schools or the supporting schools, but also the businesses to businesses, the top business people in, in, in all the cultures to stand together, then you have a much better approach towards your schooling and the development of that schooling, which is what we need. We need people in our rural areas, which we can use in our company. We need good people. We must employ people that have got the right um, profile as far as the, um, you know, the, the skills that they need here. And at the same time, we will employ them if they if they have them, and in that way support our our community. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Felix. That's so wonderful. And so, for those of you who want to know more about this Letter Tele Circle, the uh, community of practice, it's now being supported by the Coros Foundation. Our new book. I have to do a plug for the new book. Our new book, which is full of stories of impact, is available. It's just been published. We will do many of these kind of virtual engagements around the new book, hopefully soon. Um, but chapter two is is exactly the is the story about that Let's Tele circle. So um, just to make sure that we give you an opportunity to just do a bit of a reflection on what you've heard and an opportunity to connect with other people, we're going to ask Liesl to set up new uh, breakout groups. So you're going to be in a different group from who you were with before. Um, and the question, so when you, when you go into your breakout group, obviously just quickly introduce yourself to each other. And then we have a question for you. And the question is, what struck you about what you've heard so far from me and Mateus and Oresti? I just have to say to you that none of this was planned. So I didn't know that Oresti and Mateus and Felix were gonna be on the call, just in case anybody thought we had a beautiful pre-planned uh, uh, it, well, it wasn't. It's, it's been absolutely emergent. So it's an example of kind of how we do PFP is we work with what's available in the moment and we call on the gifts and the assets and the contributions of people who can bring that and we, we facilitate magic. So Liesl, are we ready to go? I think let's make it, let's kind of, Peter says we should not get too tribal. So let's make it seven minutes in the breakout room and then we still have 20 minutes to have our rest of our conversation. Are you ready for us? 
You are muted, Liesl. Sorry, ready, and here we go. Fantastic, thank you. For those that still left on my screen, you should be seeing a little box on your screen where you accept the room you've been invited to. Just accept that. Hi, Lisa. Okay. Hi, anybody on this um, screen can hear me. Have you received an invitation to join a breakout room on your screen? Hi, yes, Liesl. I was in a breakout room, but there was no one else in there with me, so I came back to this room. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I, I also got an invite. I'm just distracted right now, so... I have okay, five. Because there's people who are sitting alone in breakout rooms. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, that's fine. I, 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 I said to who called me. Okay, well, let's chat in this room then. Um, Sandra, what stood out for you? Yeah, I, I think the main thing is about um, taking the time to, to develop the relationship. Um, you know, not pay, paying um, lip service to that. And that takes as long as it takes to build that um, authentic relationship with the people that you're working with. I think that for me um, really, really stood out. It was the, the one thing about that heart connection and making that central to, to the design. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, very powerful. I, I, I was... Um... You cannot be useful until you understand. That that is that was also so powerful for me. Amy, thanks for coming back. Um, it seems there's a few people who got distracted or were busy with other things and just listening and didn't realize there were rooms with people waiting for them. <laughs> That's no problem. Okay. So what stood out for you? So I must apologize. I've also been one of those who's been on the phone and lived in the background. But I must just admit, uh, partner's possibility has been incredible. So I'm based in the Midlands and I have been involved um, from sort of a community aspect, um, being involved with um, Midlands 1 and now just launching Midlands 2. And just a phenomenal process to watch at the site and just watch people grow and watching how the PFP1 circle, Midlands, has coped so much better with COVID um, than the other schools. Just really the, the learnings from last year have really helped. Mm. Yeah, that's wonderful. And seeing it must be, must feel really good. Mm, it really is. And, you know, I think also, you, you know, um, it's one thing studying and it's one thing like going through this training and you can literally put it into practice that afternoon or that next day at work um, so yeah really really interesting oh great one unassigned celeste did not join okay um I don't off. oh that's okay um celeste you can you can stay in this room we've only got two minutes left uh, i'm gonna ask um anybody else that wants to share what stood out for you hussein Lungi, 
I think we're talking to people that's busy with other stuff, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Celeste, would you like to share what stood out for you? Um, I think it, it was very informative, you know, to learn about the different things that happen and how, you know, although um, she worked in a first world country like the UK, how things, she tried to apply here, worked there, but didn't work here. And, you know, it, it was just interesting. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to invite everybody else back. Um, okay, I can say something. So, um, I, I've been involved with PFP as a business partner. And uh, personally, I wish um, I could just do that. Uh, because it's in the doing that you also transform yourself. So the, the whole experience is not only um, helping the principal, it also helps you to grow in mm. a way that you would otherwise not. Um, that very experience of waiting um, and not saying much in the first few <laughs> whatever months, um, it's, it's uh, it trains you as well because you're not quick to make judgment. You're not quick to bring solution, which you manufacture from your hip. You then really, you, you must connect with the person. So the whole notion of you cannot be useful until you understand it's so important. Most people in business simply run with uh, short term solutions. Where? Our time. <coughs> what I said, it's belongs to the, it's the building. Yeah. Thank you so much. What's your name? Pamela? So this is the problem with um, people being thrown back into the main room and they're still uh -huh. mid -sentence. they're still finishing a conversation. Uh -huh. um, so we, we now have, um, we have about, I think, just under half an hour to just have a conversation. And I'm hoping now that you've talked a little bit together that you are, you're ready to, to join in. So Kubeshni has got her hand up. Kubeshni is from the Western Cape Education Department. Kubeshni, we'd love to hear from you. Okay. Thank you, Louise. I was saying to uh, the lady I met online now who works in Paul. She was in academia and she's now uh, working in community uh, building. Uh, what I found most useful was the sense of heart. So I go back to that wonderful expression of people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's the willingness to open ourselves and be vulnerable uh, that contributes to relationship building. Um, if I look at the principles that I worked with, I felt that they'd gained so much from their uh, involvement in Partners for Possibility. If I had uh, a principal raise an issue at one of the schools, I didn't need to go in and say, here I am, you know, Savior Kubeshni with the angel wings, let me help you. <laughs> I could say, but you know, principal so-and-so down the road, attended this course and this is what he or she learned and uh, let me connect you with them so that perhaps you know you can gain an understanding of what they did etc so what i was doing was i was subtly getting them to build a relationship as a community of principals in my circuit but also ensure that there is peer learning sometimes principals you know because you're their supervisor they don't want to show their vulnerability to you but they can connect with another principal down the road and i found that that kind of peer learning was amazing and uh, you know when i uh, left the circuit to move to another position i remember tony ryan saying that we were able to form a relationship. And Tony Ryan was from Ronnebosch Boys Prep out in the southern suburbs, what we referred to as the Leafy Schools, helping a school in Marienburg. And uh, he said, uh, 
very quickly they were able to come together as a community of uh, principals and you know work with each other and i felt that that for me was important how do you bring the heart and the humanity into an organization that up until now has been kind of cold and gray Thank you, Kabeshni. And I think for me, what I, as an organizational development leadership, I'm not an educationalist. What I got excited about is how this program was having impact on the people involved. So, so you would need to be quite an arsehole, sorry, uh, to be part of a, a partners possible leadership circle and not be affected on a very deep level. So I'm going to tell you one quick story. So Hanel is saying it's all about relationships. It's exactly all about relationships. But what most of these, remember, we get some quite clinical, hard-nosed business leaders who join the program. And, and I've always struggled with the fact that it's so hard to, to break through that veneer and that shell. So I'm going to share you one story. We had um, uh, one of our, the, our team members uh, felt that her husband needed to be a partner to a principal, not for the principal's benefit, for his benefit. She felt that he needed some insight in himself. And she whispered to me quietly that he needed to do the program because he's a complete arsehole. And, uh, and he always knows how to, everything gets done. And he's always the one with all the answers. And, you know, he just tells everybody what to do. And it was driving her nuts. And she couldn't, she's a coach. She just didn't know how to get through to him. And she felt that partners possibly will help him. Now, in hindsight, I have, I have some questions around the ethical piece around this because we partnered in with a principal, knowing this background. He had a coach. They were supported by someone. But lo and behold, four or five months into the program, the principal said, I'm out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. Which often happens in those kind of situations. Yeah. So because we've seen this before, we knew how to deal with it. So we sent in the learning process facilitator. She acted like a relationship coach, not acted. She was a relationship coach. She got them back together. And so we always do, we have a, 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 a monitoring and evaluation process that kind of looks at what happens in all the circles. And when something like that happens, we talk about, so we've got a relationship challenge. It's a wobble. The, the partnership has hit a wobble. Anyway, so we got them back together. And then I attended the celebration event. Because I was curious to know how this is all turned out, and the guys stood up on the screen, and the on the because they each get a chance. The business leader talks about their experience, the principal talks about their experience, and then they talk about what they've done as a, as a partnership. This business leader stood up. I, we've got it on video, so I mean, I can even show you the video if you need, if anybody wants to see the video. Anyway, he he um he stood up. He said, "You know what I've discovered through PFP is that I can be a real asshole to work with," <laughs> and um, and and. This has been really insightful for me. And as a result of my principal chasing me away, I had to look into the mirror and I had to realize that's what I do to people is I tell them what to do and I think I have all the answers. And I've been confronted with my, my racism and my white privilege and my privilege as a man and all of that stuff. And, um, and now, and partner's possibility has helped me become aware of all of that. And I am much more conscious and I'm, now, I promise you, I have taught at many business school, MBAs, et cetera, et cetera. I've never seen that. I've never seen that level of insight. And it wasn't as if we'd beaten him up to get to that insight. He just needed to have a hard connection with the principal and she needed to get fed up with him. And she needed to say, no, I'm not going to work with you if you tell me what to do any, more, any further. So, so, so as a leadership development person, I go, oh my goodness, that's fantastic. But then I also want to say, I, in my post PFP life, I'm really interested in how we can use what we've done with Partners for Possibility in local government, in health, in agriculture, but also in corporate. So a little while ago, it was too long ago, actually, I need to go back. I spoke with the CEO of a large corporate and he said, Louise, I have to be honest with you. I have no interest in making a difference in education. I want my organization to work. And my organization is currently grappling with, um, we have white people, we call them silverbacks. We have these white silverbacks 
engineers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, who need to, who, who, who will be leaving us soon uh, for many reasons. They old or they white, whatever the reasons. And then I've got this emerging new group of black guys who have a lot to offer, but they haven't yet. Found. Can you create a partner for possibility program for them? You know, could you help me create this hard connection between these, you know, white, more senior, more experienced group of people and this young black, etc. And so that's one of the things that I'm, I'm wondering which organization is going to be brave enough to take this on and, and to develop, you know, instead of it's, and, and, and the fact is it's, it's, it's not, it's, it, it's always reciprocal. So, so, you know, the, the very experienced business leaders learn as much from the principles as the principles learn from them. But I think the other, that, that would be true in, um, in today's world, I mean, I'm learning huge amounts from my 19 and 22 year old children, but because I'm open to that. But, and so I'm wondering about that. I'm, I'm not sure and I don't have the answers, but um, oh, any other thoughts from anybody? Thank you, Pamela. Yes, Pam, Pamela. Um, well, um, I, I'm as always absolutely thrilled and delighted to be here. And um, what I was, um, uh, what's been coming through very clearly is confirmation of something that one of the, uh, as, as a very small child taught me once, and that is that true um, collaboration is partnering as friends. And all of our, those of us in the health world and the uh, educational field and so on have always been advice givers of note and those of us that know best. And where, um, I, was, I was a physiotherapist, but I worked as a coach and was all about ensuring success so people could build confidence. So it, it parallels what you're doing entirely, and, and, um, but I'm learning so much now. And this little boy who was the floppiest child that I'd ever met um, had just uh, achieved an incredible goal. He'd gone up onto his toes and reached up high um, and dropped a two kilogram medicine ball into a basket. So he rolled it over the edge. He wasn't having to jump up, but it had helped him get his whole reach and um, I always uh, used the video a lot and I was filming him and chatting to his, uh, showing it to him and his father. And then he turned around and he said to me, in absolute horror, and what about the friends? And what he meant was, would you please show those pictures to the two nurses that are sitting here from Red Cross that are learning about communicating health to children. So if we redefine it as partnering a friend, as friends, it takes us back to that one meeting at the sports science. And I think the guy was from Ned, the business leader was from Ned Bank, and I think the clubman's principal is called Ronnie. And the guy from Ned Bank said, well, I fortunately realized as I walked in the door that Ronnie had a lot to offer. And I mean, they couldn't have been more different in build, in speech, in anything else. But they proceeded to tell the story of how the school had gone from um, a couple of containers on a piece of sand to complete regeneration. I think it's one of the schools that's got an old a telephone kiosk in the grounds with the books to read and at a break, the reading lab. Um, but, but that partnering as friends is exactly what you're doing, is yeah. um, what's the gift in this challenge? How do we put our networks together to make it work? And it's the story of my rehab as well. So thank you. So, thanks, Pamela. And in the new book, so my next plug for the new book, in the new book, there's a chapter around schools becoming the, the hub, the, the, uh, a magnet for the gifts and contributions from people in the community. And Ronnie and Thew's story is in that book. And um, Thew's from Remgro. So you can imagine Remgro is very, very business, 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 and um, his heart has been completely broken open by this experience. Um, and so that's what it's about. It's about so so the uh, the core idea underpinning PFP, but it and it underpins Flawless Consulting and all of the work that we've learned from Peter Block is that the delivery vehicle of my expertise is my humanity. And so if I'm if it is about my humanity, then it is about, um, you know, who I am when I show up and, and, and how I do I make people feel. And, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's, it's those are the core ideas that these business leaders, I've always tried to, to get them to get those ideas um, 
by having them in classrooms at MBA, you know, in business school. And I've never been as successful as, I, as we collectively have been through PFP because I don't have to teach people. We're just giving them the experience and the experience teaches them and the principals teach them and their colleagues. And it's not, you know, we're moving away. We've always talked about moving away from, from sage on the stage to guide on the side and, you know, being a, being a accompanying people on this journey. Um, so if anybody on this call have any thoughts about, you know, I'm in that beautiful space now where I'm going, what's my next? What am I going to do next after Partners Possibility? But I really do feel I want to, I want to take what we've learned and developed and take that into, you know, the future of OD, the future of leadership development, the future of capacity building, of dealing with the significant issues facing our country. Um, that's what I'm currently spending lots of time thinking about. And the, so reason it the, the reason it works with the principles is that the principal has already got the heart to give. He's been giving his heart, but um, which is heart and humanity being synonymous. And, and so that was very clever to start that way. You picked the right one to start with too. <laughs> I think so, Pamela, but what I've also realized is at, at, the, you know, at our, our core, all of us, we yearn for these kind of relationships. Um, so, Liesl, I'm going to hand back to you. We've got 12 wrapping up. Or Christo? Yeah, I, I think um, we, we should just check if anybody has, a, has something they still want to share, a beautiful moment or, or some some questions then put up your hand uh, we can maybe do one or two more um, I know not everybody was um, fully aware of uh, PFP before this session so you might have a question please put up your hand um, and, um, and let us know if there's a last a last aha you want to share with us um, I want to invite Christy to also Dave have Evans. A... Dave Evans, Dave. I've been involved in a different area using um, computer modeling to help make better decisions. Operational research was the original name for this. And we failed to get into the public sector with that for the last 40 years. It's a well-established technique in areas like education and health. There are models all over the world which could be rolled in and implemented yesterday and we just cannot get in there. And in terms of what you were saying, Louise, I would guess if you're going to move out of education, the public sector is probably the one where we could have most impact. But how do we get in there? <laughs> Well, I think we have someone from the National School of Government on this, on this call. And I have a sense that the National School of Government is part of the future. Now, you have to remember that we didn't follow any, we didn't follow protocol with, with PFP. We didn't ask permission. We didn't ask the Education Department whether we could do this. Um, now, you could argue that maybe that was a bit disrespectful, maybe that was a bit rebellious, but the reason why is I got very firm advice from someone who knew the education department well to say, if you're going to ask permission, you're going to be stopped because they're going to say no. And I didn't want to get a no. So, um, so we went in and then by the time we had about 150 partnerships in Cape Town, I was called to on the red carpet and I was... I was, I was really given a very hard time. I want to make sure that I keep my language uh, appropriate. But um, the head of education at the, part, at the time uh, gave me a very big piece of her mind and told me that she didn't think that what we were doing was useful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And luckily by that time I had, I had an, uh, imp I could show impact. And I could say, well, it's very interesting that you say that because this morning I had three calls from principals who said, please, can it be part of PFP? So your story is not true. And um, we agreed not to like each other and not to disagree. And we continue to do the work because this is about 
So in education, we know that education is a public good. It is, it's, it's ultimately the responsibility of citizens. Schools do not belong to government. And what's wonderful in South Africa, we have the National Development Plan that says we have to have cross-sector collaboration, business, government, civil society have to work together. It's the only way that we're gonna reach Vision 2030, which, which I think unfortunately is now a bit out of reach for us. But the fact is we had a map. I just kept trying that national. Now the problem is it, we started PFP in 2010. The National Development Plan was only print, you know, published in 2012. So we, we, we had two years without a mandate. But when we got that mandate, goodness have we used that mandate. So I think it's about just, you know, choose one or two, three people, get them, you know, invite them. If people say yes, show, show the impact, and then you can go and ask permission and get more people to do it. But you have to start, you have to do skunk works. Um, you know, that, I, I hope many people know that term. It's you have to start under the radar and just have impact and not, not get you know, agreement and buy-in and sign-off, because that will take you, you know, anyway, but it's not easy. It, it definitely is not easy. So I see Rebecca and Tom's um, uh, have unmuted themselves. I don't know whether any of them, either of them want to say something. Rebecca Wakeford and Tom Bassett. Doesn't look like it, so. Yeah, so Louise, what I, what I heard you say, now um in this last minute or two as you were speaking is believe in what you do be passionate about what you do and have courage um <laughs> and tenacity and tenacity and resilience <laughs> yeah and have I a community of people who believe in what you're doing i mean you know in those early years if i didn't have <coughs> craig as a partner craig and i spent many many you know, hours under under oak trees, dreaming about what might be possible, and 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 in many ways that gave me the courage to continue. And um, I mean, I remember a day just as in at that building of yours, um, we had just won. I had won an award, in, uh, international award, um, in in London, and and the the award ceremony was going to be in London, and I had no way to get to London because there was just I just didn't have money and you know you don't have money when you do the stuff you have to you have to you know. and Craig listened to me and he said hold on and 10 minutes later he came back he said we are and now I'm getting emotional he said we'll we'll buy your flight you need to go to London to go and get this award and it was because of moments like that that I could keep going so next time when you see him in the corridor you can tell him I tell this told the story but you do need mates, you need friends, and you need a community. And, um, and that's the only reason why I've been able to keep going. And we have been able to keep going. Mm. Yeah, so I think we've come to the end. So we hand over, I, uh, I don't know, Krista, whether you wanted to say something as a final thought from Will's view. Mm. I'm just very inspired by the work that you've done uh, so far, Louise. And when we had the check out, the conversation did go to, wow, it worked here in education. Uh, there's lots of other spaces in our society where similar kinds of, of work is, is, is required. So we, we'd love to stay in, con I certainly personally would love to stay in conversation with you about your, about your next plans and what you're thinking and, 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 and we, how can, how can we support and get involved and, uh, and, 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 and make more contribution to this? Hmm. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today and for being part of this conversation. And um, Liesl, will you, uh, I, I mean, I'd be very happy if anybody wants to drop me a note or send me, be in conversation about this if, if you wanted to just let, let, make, make my contact details available to people. Um, well, obviously the PFPs already have it, but maybe there's other people who's not part of mm. PFP already. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then I, 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 I would quite like to share, share this with our community. So, um, oh. and so I'll, I'll, if, if once the video is available, we'll make that available. Yeah. Yeah, so, so everyone, um, if you registered on our website, you will now be getting a weekly mailer 
that would invite you to the weekly talks. So like Chris said, next week is about trauma and organizations. The week after we have the renowned Dominic Hale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it automatically happens like that on our website when you register. If you don't like it, please just unsubscribe. But I'm sure everybody that was here would really enjoy our topics. Um, and Louise, just thank you for you. Thank you for being here. Um, we, we lightly mentioned, would you be interested? And you grabbed it with both hands and you were just absolutely so great and so inspirational. There's so many things that came up in the, in the conversation today that I wrote down and then highlighted with the orange highlighter <laughs> because I have to remember to go back to it and use it and think about it and talk about it with my clients and, and anybody that wants to listen. So thank you so much. Thank you for the inspiration. And, and um, may your courage and your passion stay as strong for, for this, for this, um, for Partners for Possibility, but for whatever you take on next, I'm, I'm confident it'll be a great success. So thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Louis.